Men on these few scriptures, these few verses of this scripture, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. I want you to pick up on this, this idea of first that, that's placed through here in different ways. Listen, He is the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, for, for that protection that it offers us. For the provisions that it gives to us as we pursue lives of spiritual discipline where we, we retreat into you as we've read in, in other parts of Colossians where, where in Christ we are made free and in Christ we have power. And now to recognize that, that even in, in our, our needs you are the first place, the first fruits, the firstborn. You are before, and you are all things to us today, God. Uh, work that in us that only you can work. Transform our hearts, our minds, our souls to long for you more than anything else. And that we would seek you and long for you first in all things. For it's in Christ's name that we pray and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. He is the image of of the invisible God talking about Christ in the flesh who came as our example as our Savior as our Redeemer and our Lord spiritual disciplines probably more than anything else move us from that place of understanding Christ as our Savior into the understanding of Christ as our Lord uh, more than anything else uh, we we have come to a place of need of salvation we talked about it last week uh, in, in that that need of, of justification we come to an altar of prayer knowing that there is sin that separates us. Uh, in, in, that, <clears throat> in that place of coming to him for the separation from our sins, we, we right last week talked about it, it's, it's the sins with the S on the end of it. It's the things that we're doing that we know are wrong. That, that's probably, Phil, one of the things that makes us recognize. We, we get into things that we're doing wrong, and, and, and we know it's wrong, but we're, we're participating in it. But then our heart begins to be just ripped apart because we know it's separating us from God. And that's that moment of spiritual crisis that we realize, I need salvation. I need to be redeemed. I need to be justified in this. So we come to that place of calling him Savior. But then there's that move of, of the second work of grace there that we talk about in the place of sanctification that we recognize that even, even after I've been given a new heart, I'm still not spiritually strong or capable enough to, to keep this heart pure. And so in sanctification, I begin to call upon him as my guide. I tried it my way. How many of you have tried it my way? You went the old Elvis Presley way, right? I did it my way, right? And, and we tried it our way, and that's what got us in the mess that we were in. And, and so when we come out of that place where we, where we get a new heart, uh, some of us, got, we've got a new heart, but we've still got that song playing in our head. I'm going to do it my way. And we'll, we'll battle that. But then there's a point in our life where we say, you know what, there's got to be more than this. And so we give our hearts over to him, not as Savior, he's already our Savior. We give our hearts to him as Lord. There's a difference. Savior gets me for then. Lord gets me for now. And he wants your life to be a life of abundance now. Yeah, glory will come, but, but he wants the abundance now. He wants to see the Spirit of God alive in you now. And so he, he wants to become your Lord. Spiritual disciplines are, are, are the track, they're the pathway that move us to, to this, this place where Christ becomes Lord of our life, where we seek him first, where, where we, we can contribute our, our, our desires to his desires, our will to his will. And it's a process. Listen, if you're not, if you're not there yet, listen, keep, keep being sensitive to the whisper of the Spirit. That's where he's leading you. You may not be there right now, but he's leading you there. 
And, and as we engage spiritual disciplines, we, we, it's almost like uh, having that, that amplifier come on where, where, where the noise is a little louder. We can hear the voice a little louder. Matter of fact, uh, our, our next series that we're, we're going into from this one, that's, that's the title of our series is Amplify. It's Amplify. Uh, it, that, that we could hear the voice of the Lord stronger in our life because of the disciplines that we're engaging. But more than that, that our lives will begin to amplify the beauty of Christ to everybody that's around us. And so we need this, this transformation in us and spiritual disciplines walk it. Today, uh, we're going to be moving to the next one. Last week, we talked about uh, perseverance, the place of perseverance. Uh, we, we understand that success, success on this journey, Success in this walk with Christ, it, it takes a spirit of perseverance. And perseverance, it, it again, it, is, is a discipline that provides opportunity for us. And, and perseverance provides opportunity for his strength to work in our weakness. If I stick with it, even through my weakness, his strength shows up. He, he gets me through. He provides for me. He protects me. But if I, if I quit short, if I stop in the, in the effort, I never, I never witnessed that fullness of his strength alive in my life. So perseverance is that discipline of, of, of the inner man or the inner woman that provides the opportunity for God's strength, his strength, to work in our weaknesses. Now in that place of perseverance, we're, we're going to look today at the discipline of generosity. Of generosity. And we're talking about different, different values of generosity. We have generosity that's, that's that of, of our time. We've got generosity that's that of our resource or our talent, things that we are capable of doing that, that is a part of our capacity or a part of our knowledge that may not be common to others. We, we have that, that place of needing to be generous because we're all part of the same body of Christ and each one participating uh, creates a more dynamic place for God to move and for, for needs to be met. And, and the more we're generous with our time and the more we're generous with our talents, uh, we, we see the hand of God able to reach different places and different times. I'll give you one example of that. Our, our church is initiating something that is going to be a benefit to our local high school because we have some, some abilities, we have some, some resources, we have some talents. We're going to begin a, a um, South Davidson uh, sports network for the southern end of the county, and, and, and our students will be recognized, our coaches will be recognized, and several from our church are going to be initiating uh, a video website that's going to be a, a news source of, of, of our, our student body, a band member of the week, uh, the teachers of the week, different things like that that can highlight some of the things that are there. Uh, you say, well, how in the world will that work? Every, every time that it's placed in there, it's a relationship that's built. And every relationship that's built gets the chance to magnify or amplify uh, the, the love of God. Another one, we have this Amplify opportunity. Our church has been invited uh, to go and, and, and lead the cleanup effort in our town for, on October the 17th. It's the fall cleanup for the town of Denton. And, and, and the sign-up sheet is right out there. And, and already about 45 or 50 of you have signed up. We're excited about that prospect. You say, well, how is that at a part? Well, there are going to be people from the community that are going to come out and help as well. And you'll get to work alongside of them. And you'll get to utilize gifts and talents and abilities. We have some construction work that needs to be done, some roofing work that needs to be done, some cleanup, some painting, different things. You'll get to work alongside of them and begin to magnify or amplify that that God has created new in you. And so we have this opportunity to be generous in, in our time and generous in our talents and then generous in, in our treasures and, and, and in that place where, where the rubber meets the road sometimes for us as, as, as um, we've heard from, from uh, the, the Focus on the Family group that to, to recognize how important things are to you. Look at two things, our, our calendar and our checkbook, uh, that, that place of being generous in our, in our giving, in our finances, in our resource in our treasure. That, that idea of being generous is, is, <coughs> is something that, that is, has long been a part of our understanding our, our life. Here's, here's what Elton Trueblood says, a man has made at least a start on discovering the meaning of human life when he plants shade trees under which he knows full well he will never sit. We, he's saying to us that our generosity and our time and our talent and our treasure is best invested when we recognize there's no way that we're going to get paid back for what we're investing. It, it, it speaks to the motive, right? It speaks to the motive of our giving. We understand that there is good that comes out of our giving. I, I know people that are not Christians, but they tithe. 
Go figure that. I know Christians who, who are Christians that don't tithe. Figure that one out, right? And, and I, I talked to them. I said, well, you know, what, what in the world? Uh, why are you tithing and you're not even a believer? You don't, you don't profess Christ as your Savior. And he said, me professing Christ as Savior uh, does nothing uh, to, to the reality that God's word, his promise is going to be fulfilled. And his promise is that this is an investment that yields a return. Now, his motive is not necessarily to please God. His motive is to see the return. There, there is great gain. That's his motive is, is, is in there. But the reality is, uh, as True Blood says to us, that the motive is that we are doing this for a kingdom to come. And until that kingdom comes, we're doing it for a generation that is to follow. We're leading with example. We're giving opportunity. We're, we're multiplying and, and expanding the tent, the, the influence of the kingdom. And so our generosity, he says, is, is a, a discovery of meaning. Our generosity is for a time to come. I want you to realize this, that generosity, your generosity today, is based in trusting your source of resources. That's, that's the base. That's the heart of it. A person gives, uh, usually uh, if we give out of our, our reality of what our resource is, uh, giving begins to be very restricted. Because when we give out of what we know our resource is, especially in an economy that's just like this all the time, we, we will begin to constrict or we'll bring back or we'll restrict what we'll give because we're, we're fearful or wondering, will I be taken care of? But generosity is based on an understanding that, that there is a source beyond us to our resource. That God himself is a provider. And that his provision follows a plan. And that, that, that understanding, the simple understanding, is it, it's, it, it's, it's a heart issue. We, when we understand that we cannot outgive God, then, then we are uninhibited in the way that we offer our time, our talents, and our treasures. We're, we're a little less restrictive when we recognize that that that, that we, we offer over to him is, is an investment of seed that returns a yield that's multiplied. It's his plan. Even an unbeliever recognizes it. But believers should embrace it. It's the base of understanding that, that our source is bigger. William Carey, who was a missionary, that I once was young and now I'm old, but not once have I been witness to God's failure to supply my need when first I had given for the furtherance of his work. He has never failed in his promise, so I cannot fail him in my service. William Carey, that missionary who says, basically, you cannot outgive God when he calls you to the place of being generous, then he's going to supply that that you might be given up. He's going to multiply it in the place of your provision of your uh, being protected our source is greater and, and, and if our source is God it'll be revealed in, in our obedience and generosity if we really claim in that place that God is our source then it should show up in the way that we offer and give ourselves time talent, treasure to the kingdom's work if it's for then then it'll show up in what I do now. And in this, uh, we, we have a, uh, John Christendom. He, he's an early church father from around 400 A.D. He was the archbishop of Constantinople. He said this. He said, things themselves do not remain. Man, we should learn that lesson. We hear it in the New Testament when it says that, that moth will destroy and rust will destroy. Material things will not and do not remain, but their effects do. What he's saying is how we invest them do. Therefore, we should not be mean and calculating with what we have, but give with a generous hand. Look at how much people give to players and dancers. Even back in the day, right, 400 A.D., he's saying look at how much money people spend in the, in the search of entertainment. Why not give just as much to Christ? We, we are, are revealing in our obedience and our generosity just who our source is or where we get our satisfaction, where we get our, 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 our fellowship that wells up within us into life. Generous giving. It's not just something that we do in, in the now. It's also an act of worship to God. 
Generosity is an act of worship unto God. Dennis Bake uh, is a little-known businessman. He's, he's not among the likes of, of some of those that you hear all the time in, in the Fortune 500s that they see their name on the headlines all the time, but he should be. Dennis Bake, uh, one of the reasons that you won't see him there among the world's wealthiest, that is, look at my pot, it's full. It's because Dennis Bake has learned the, the reality of giving, that life is found in giving. In 1981, Dennis Bake uh, co-founded a, a company called Applied Energy Services. Applied Energy Services was a consulting firm in Washington, D.C. Uh, for, for all of the big power companies. And, and, and they began to, to show and, and, and do studies of, of where they were being wasteful and how they were being. So he, he began to, to become more efficient. And in that efficiency, uh, they, they began to be utilized over and over again until they started their own supply source for power. Not only in the United States, but they've been embraced actually more in other countries. And Dennis Bake went from being a man that was, was, was making it to a man that, that has a, a gross earnings and net worth right now of about $8 billion through this corporation. But personally, he won't have this because his corporation believes in tithing. Get this. Dennis Bake, from the top of their profits gives to organizations. They started a mission organization that, that builds schools and orphanages in, in underprivileged and, and impoverished areas of our world. And to, to this date, they started that in, in 1992. From 1992 until the stat showed in, in 2008, they had over 141 schools that they've built and over 100 orphanages that they've built and staff and supply salaries for the staff, provide all the means necessary for these in, in, in places where they might not make it. And so of, of that income, he still lives on a modest portion. You say, well, wait a minute, your pot's not full. But his life is. And the fullness of eternity is his because he recognized. Here's what, here's what Dennis Bake said about it when he was interviewed on, on, the, on the idea of why do you give so much. He says, what is the chief end of giving? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Let me tell you something. You'll enjoy a dollar bill for a little while. Don't get it wrong, right? He said, money can't buy you happy, but you'll put a smile on your face for a little bit, right? You'll enjoy a dollar bill for a moment. But the chief end of giving, the, the stewardship idea of generosity is that God is to be enjoyed forever. And the chief end of that giving is to give glory to him. Here's the statement, guys. We become generous. And, and we embrace, as we embrace the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. We, we become generous when we recognize the full impact of the generosity that God showed towards us. In, in the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross, and, and we are then compelled to respond. Generosity is a response. It's an issue of the heart. It's a response of my heart to long after and, and to show up in the places where God shows up. It's a response to his giving to me. Tony Compolo, who, who is an evangelist and a, a sociologist, he tells of being invited to speak at a, a ladies' meeting one time. And in this ladies' meeting, there were about 300 women that were present there. And, and before he spoke, as he was, he was getting ready to come up, the, the, the president of the organization took the microphone for a minute and said, Brother Campolo, before you speak, I received this letter today. And she shared the letter from a missionary who had expressed a need. <coughs> On their mission field of service, they had a need that was so much larger than them in the economy of the third world country that she was working in. It was a need for $4,000. It, it was beyond anything that they could bring together. And she said an emergency was coming. If they, if they, if they didn't have that $4,000, they were going to have to fold up the operation there. So the president of the organization said, we need to pray that God will provide the resources to meet this need. So Brother Campolo, will you please pray for us? And Tony Campolo looked at him and said, no. Can you, can you imagine the collective gasp from 300 Christian ladies that were gathered? Isn't it the Christian thing to do to pray for this? But Campolo, who, who's known for being outspoken, and, and he said, no. And she startled, looked at him and said, I beg your pardon? Campolo continues, he said, no, I won't pray for that. He said, I believe that God has already provided the resources 
and that we don't need to pray. What we need to do right now is give. Hear him. He said, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to step up to this table and I'm going to give every bit of cash that I have in my pocket. And I believe that if all of the rest of you will do the same, I think God has already provided all the resources for this need. The president of the organization kind of laughed under her breath and said, well, I, I guess we get the point. He's trying to teach us that uh, we all need to give sacrificially. And again, he looked at her and he said, no. That is not what I'm trying to teach you. I'm trying to teach you that God has already provided for this missionary. All we need to do is give it. And he walked to the table and he put down all of his money. He said he had uh, between $15 and $18. And so I, I wasn't too worried about it. He said when I put it down there, I was a little embarrassed. So when he put his money down, he looked at the president of the organization who reluctantly opened her purse and took out all of her money, which was about $40, and put it on the table. And then they sat down, and in the silence, one by one, the rest of the ladies filed in and put what they had on the table, too. And they went on with the conference. After the conference, they had counted the money, and they had collected a little over $4,100. In closing the session, Compolo said, Now, here's the lesson. God always supplies for our needs. Always supplies for our needs. And he supplied for this missionary. The only problem with the supply is that sometimes we like to keep it for ourselves. And then he said, now let's pray. And let's thank God for the provision. Generosity. And in the issue of the heart and the place of giving. And listen, it, it reveals first my obedience. It reveals my obedience to God. We, we like to find wormholes, right? We like to find those places where we can get out. We'll say, well, well the, the issue of, of tithing is it's an Old Testament thing. And it's, it's a legalistic thing. And, and we shouldn't be bound to this legalistic thing. And, 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 and we say, all right, great. Well, the New Testament is even bigger than that. It says, go and sell everything that you have and come and give it to the poor. Right? Wait a minute, I like tithing better all of a sudden. The idea of generosity is God has a networked plan. It is not a confused plan. It's not a failing plan. And his plan is, is in the work of obedience that you don't, you don't need to be in the place of saying, I, I have to give him every dollar, but you give him all of yourself. And when I give him all of myself, the 10% is easy. It's easy. And so we... We follow in the plan of obedience that of the tithe. We, we follow in the plan of the obedience the place of offering uh, of our time and our talents. We follow in the place of obedience our service in the place of compassion. It's obedience. Uh, we, we don't do it the wrong motive. We don't do it to be looked at. We don't do it to say, look, wow. We don't look to say, hey, my pot's full. We, we do it in a motive of God and say, this furthers your kingdom you've called me to pay, be a part of it you know right it's, it's one of the five G's if you're a member at, at Denton Wesleyan Church when we go through the membership class one of the five G's is generosity and this is where we talk about this place it, it, we believe in the tithe we believe in offering we believe in resourcing and helping those in our community it's a part of the DNA of our church but bigger than that it's a part of the obedient plan of God and so we, we need to be obedient. In my response, it also reveals my, my consistency to the understanding of first fruits. My consistency to the understanding of God's provision. First fruits is a place of understanding God's provision. That's what that whole term of first fruits. He is the firstborn, He is the first fruits. What, what it reminds me of in that place of the first fruits is I don't wait and see what I've got left to give to God. Generosity gives up front, recognizing that God will fill in the gaps. Generosity says that in the first fruits, uh, in, in the Old Testament and into the New Testament, when they brought a, a, an offering to God, they brought of the first fruits, recognizing that even, even if something were to occur, that the other 90% were to begin to wane, God will show up and make up the difference. And so the first fruits is I give from the top. And then watch God begin to fulfill with the remainder. It's a consistent place.
in, in the place of giving and understanding, uh, as, our, as our mind is wrapping around a hard issue, we have that place of perseverance where God will begin to and he will reveal to and he will show up with what you need. And across time, uh, you will become like uh, a, a gentleman that I know. He's 82 years old. He, he, he comes to me and he, he says, I, I need to put my tithe in. Well, I said, well, well you, with your tithe coming in, and, and I'm concerned. I said, well, you know, uh, you know I appreciate this. You're, you're still tithe. I know you haven't had this income in a while. His tithe is actually well above 10%. His tithe is probably closer to 15 18% of what, what their income is right now. And I said, I don't, are, are you sure that's what you want to give? And, 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 well, I heard this family. Let me give a little extra. And I'm in the place. Now, I'm the pastor. I, I'm, I'm sitting there saying, well, you know, are you sure? He says, and he looks at me and he says, you cannot outgive God. I have learned in my life one thing, that God honors those that consistently give. And, and although he's not been able to be a part of our, our physical congregation for a while, they're still there in the place of generosity. Still listening and, and praying through. I, they, they've even called me in the place of prayer and said, I've been praying. I, I, I sense in my spirit that there's a person that has a need. And then they'll want to meet the need. Consistency. Not consistency with the pocketbook, but consistency in the, in, the, in the person of God. When I'm walking close to God, one of the first things I will become is Generous. When I'm consistent in my walk, it'll overflow in the consistency of my generosity. And my response will reveal passion. I, I love the way the scripture says it, right? It says that, that God loves a cheerful giver. That, that term literally means a hilarious giver. What, what's, what's a, a hilarious giver? You, you ever heard somebody laugh when you know they were just kind of faking the laugh? I hear it all the time because I've got some of the most lame jokes in all the world, right? I'll tell one of my lame jokes. Somebody, <laughs> right? But have you ever heard a person when they just could not stop laughing? We have a game we play around our house. Y'all have not lived until you've heard my wife get into one of those hilarious laugh moments. All right? The kids will come home and, and, and will try to get, they'll, they'll do anything to get her started laughing because then she can't stop. And then she's laughing, and she's laughing, and she inherits her laugh through her mama's side of the family. If you put a thousand people in a room and you heard them laugh, you could, you could it'd be like a GPS. You'd go right to them just by the unique nature of that laugh. It's hilarious. It's uninhibited. There, there's no boundary to it. What, what this word is saying is not, I love a person who gives and then laughs when they give. Ha, 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 ha. It's a person that has no bounds. God, God loves the, the hilarious giver, the giver who, who does not look at their own resource, but looks to the source. The, the giver who gives in, in the place of proportion, not trying to be legalistic to the percentage, but says, God, can I give more? Don't you need more? Let me give you more. Passion. That uninhibited, that, that, that sacrificial depth. To generosity. God, God calls us to be responding there. Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary to India, who, who gave up. Uh, her, her family was a wealthy family. She gave up from a wealthy family to go into mission. She, she, she went over into India to one of the poorest uh, populations in all of the world. And, and she, she discovered this, she said, in her efforts in India. You can give without loving. But you cannot love without giving. Now what happens to me when I'm generous? What happens when I'm generous is, number one, God is glorified. <clears throat> when, I, when I offer generosity, God is glorified. We give honor to God in our generosity. It shows our, our allegiance, where, where we're investing ourselves. Matthew 6, 21, 24 says, for where, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, and, and, or uh, both God and wealth. Number two, uh, what will happen when I'm generous? In, in, in the place of, of, of the reciprocal nation of, nature of God, uh, when, when I am generous, I am blessed. When I am generous... I'm blessed. We get that in the story of Abraham all the way back in Genesis. God calls Abraham out from among the wealth of his father. And he says to him, 
uh, go where I'm showing you to go. And, and Abraham goes, and it's just Abraham and his wife. They have no children at the time, right? We've talked about it several weeks ago. He had his nephew. That was pretty much it. They begin to move out to where God is showing. And God makes a profound statement to him in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. It's a statement that God offers to any single one of us that is obedient to follow him with that hilarity, with that resolve to be uninhibited. Here's what he says in Genesis 12, 1 and 2. He says to Abraham, you're following me, you're obedient. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing to others. What is he saying? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be blessed. I'm following God. Obedient. I'll be blessed, but I'm blessed so that I can be a blessing to others. It also shows up in James chapter 1. In verse 17, he says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. What's he saying to us there? He says that in the place of our blessing, in the place of our being blessed, in the place of our offering blessing, our, our generosity, the heart and the motive of it will acknowledge the source. Every good thing that you have, all that you ever get to lay your fingers on in this world, everything that you get to be a steward of or have control of, even if it's momentary, every good and perfect gift is from that source, from God, from the Father of lights. And as we acknowledge it, we open up that door of, of, of blessing. We become a conduit to what it is that God wants to do in and through us, in our time, in our talent, in our treasure. Scripture speaks to all of those. If you, if you don't have a gift, if you desire a gift, ask of the Lord. He gives it generously. If you need, then offer unto the Lord all that you have, and he will bless generously. And so we, we are called to acknowledge that. My response uh, reveals that generous nature within me, and, and then God multiplies it by in, in him being glorified and our being blessed. Number three, what happens when I'm generous is needs are met. Needs are met. Uh, God has a plan, just like this, this story of the ladies at the meeting. There was a need that arose, and, and, and there are people there, they, when they became generous, right, the need was met. And in, in, in our understanding of Scripture, where, where we are, are choosing to be generous, we are allowing God to use us in the very way that he wants to. God chooses to use us through the resource he has given us. Here, here's an eye-opener for you. God is not calling you to give anything that he's not willing to give to you first. Did you get that? God is not calling you to give anything that he's not given to you first. He didn't say, uh, like some coaches, I love it when coaches say, I need you to give 110%. I, I'm a, I've always been a logical person. I can remember in, in, in Little League even looking at a coach and saying, I can only give 100%. That's all I got. You'll run, Kyle. <laughs> I run a little bit. Give 110%. God said give 10%. And I, I don't care where you are in that. You can do that. If I got a dollar, it's a dime. Uh, we, we, we need to be recognizing that as, as he chooses to use us, the resource that he gives, uh, you want to increase your, your resource? Start channeling your prayer, right? Another one of our spiritual disciplines. God, um, bless me so that I can bless others. God, I have a desire. We, 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 we used to have uh, rampant in the church. It used to be one of the big things. You remember, Ronald, when, when, when missions was supported by faith promise giving. Faith promise giving said, I'm trusting the Lord this year. I'm going to give beyond what I have means of this year. I'm going to promise and project that I'm going to give that much next year as God bless. And so we, we act on a faith promise. Lord, I'm having faith in you that you're going to provide so that I can provide. That's a great place to pray. It's a great place to engage that, that point of passion. Lord, I, I trust you to provide, and so I'm going I'm to write the check. I, I, I can remember saying several times, Donna, who used to be our treasurer, I said, Donna, well, we, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. This is a need that's in our community. We've gotta, let's write the check, and God will provide the balance. And he always has. He always has. 1 Timothy 6 says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, 
but on God. God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. In verse 18, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Uh, needs are met. When we're generous. Number four, the body of Christ is united. When we're generous, the body of Christ is united. Uh, Matthew 6, 21 says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Nothing connects people like a common cause to invest in together. Uh, nothing connects people like something that's bigger than them that they strive for. Uh, think about it. Uh, in, in our history here within our country, national events or issues, <coughs> sometimes national tragedies, What's the first thing that, that people, we call for unity within the nation uh, to pray for, to give towards? Nothing connects people like a common cause, it, even, even on the negative side. Nothing connects people like a common cause or a common enemy. My dad tells me the story of basic training. He said, he said they come in from all over the country. He remembers going to his, his place of basic training. He said they had guys from Mississippi, from California, from New York State, all, of, all in their same little barracks together. And he said but at first they didn't like each other because he came from different cultures. They, they didn't have anything in common until about day three. And then the one thing they had in common is every single one of them hated their drill instructor. Every single one of them, he said, uh, the drill instructor would come in at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, get your, get your sleep bag, we're going. They'd take them out in the middle of the rain, make them sleep in the rain in a sleeping bag, out in the open elements. And, and, and then as they would just get to sleep, when you first get yourself in that place, you're laying there shivering, you finally get to sleep. And as soon as you get to sleep, he wakes you up and says, get your stuff up, what are you doing out here in the rain? He said, by the end of day three, everybody hated the drill instructor. And what it did, it bonded all of them together. They had a common cause. That's in the negative way, but in the positive way, right? Nothing unites a heart of a people like giving to a greater cause. Giving to the kingdom of God is one of those causes. Uh, mission opportunities, another of those pro uh, group projects that we have is another of those. Giving time, giving talent, giving treasure to a greater cause uh, unites hearts. And the body of Christ is united whenever we give generously. And then number five, the kingdom of God grows. Romans 10, 15 says, How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things or of the gospel. The kingdom of God grows when we're generous. Our generosity sends the gospel into the world with missionaries that we support, with, with, with ministry opportunities that we engage. But it flows from the generosity of our spirit, a heart that, that is obedient, a heart that is consistent, a heart that's passionate. Listen to this story in Evangelist Tales. He said he shared once in a church with, with a man and a pastor, uh, and, and the man was, was a, a, a budding businessman. And, and as they shared at the end, he was talking about an evangelistic effort that they were, they were going out to do. And, and, and both the, the pastor of the church and this businessman wanted to invest in it. So they made a pact together, the pastor and the businessman, along with the evangelist, that they were going to begin to contribute. They were going to be generous in their giving, their tithe in their church, and then beyond that, they were going to give another portion to uh, the, the, the evangelistic effort that was going going on the business and said I'm going to give an additional 10% to this evangelistic ministry and it was great for both of them they hugged they cried they left and, and the, the, the pastor and the evangelist shared the story that that um, in that first year the businessman through his business earned ten thousand dollars so he gave a thousand dollars to the church and he gave a thousand dollars to the, the the effort of the evangelist the next year he began to uh, to increase, and he earned fifty thousand dollars profit within his business. And the next year, he, he, had, he had gone. It began to hit gangbusters. Before he knew it, he was over a hundred thousand dollars in profit. And so he gave ten thousand dollars to the church and ten thousand dollars to the evangelist. Then his business just went ridiculously above what he ever imagined. He got to the end of his twelfth year in business, and he had gone from having that ten thousand dollar business to that year going on an international market, uh, they had earned $6 million. $6 million. And he said he just got, could not bring himself to write a check for the 600000 to the church and then another 600000 
to the evangelist. And he, he labored over it until he, he called the pastor. And the pastor of the church at that time had moved on to another location, but he found him. He, he was within 30 minutes of it. He said, let me, let me come, and I've got to talk to you. He said, I need you to help me. I need you to go to God for me and get me released from this vow. And the pastor told him, come on. So he went to his office. He told the story, and he said, listen, there's no way that I can, I can give that. I was fine with my tithe with $1,000. It was no problem. But I cannot afford $6, $600,000 to each of these. I can't do it. You've got to do something, preacher. So the preacher knelt on the floor and began to pray silently. And after about 10 minutes of his praying silently, the businessman shook him on the shoulder and said, are you praying that God will let me out of the covenant to tithe? To give this 10% to you and give this 10% to them? The pastor looked at him and said, no, I'm praying that God will reduce your income back to the level where you could just give $1,000. You're good with that. <laughs> um, we, we love the idea that God has a desire to increase us. But his desire to increase, his desire to bless comes with, with the flow of blessing. Generosity. That's obedient. Generosity that's consistent. And generosity that's passionate. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, listen to the, listen to the prayer, the power prayer that comes, comes out of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 reveals a heart of prayer on the part of Paul. He says, now he who supplies to the sower, seed to the sower and bread for the for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God found in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. Our prayer today is for generous hearts. Trusting in the source continually provide seed for the sower and bread for the one that is seeking to feed and be fed. Here's our prayer today, church. If it resounds in your heart, maybe it's, maybe it's not a lifted hand, maybe it's a, a heart-to-heart -heart with God to say, Lord, where do I need to be in the place of, of uninhibited, hilarious, cheerful generosity? Here's our prayer. Father, give me a generous heart I pray God that the blessings that you've given to me that are already beyond measure will be multiplied so that I can be useful to your mission and to the cause of Christ Jesus increase my desire for you increase my hunger for your word increase my resources so that I can further invest in the kingdom of God. Make me an instrument, Father, of blessing to those that you entrust to me and that you entrust to the body of Christ that you've made me a part of and to those, Father, that you have prepared to cross my path increase my desire to share the gospel to relay not just a good work but the good news make me generous father in my heart today so that I could glorify you and be a blessing to others for it's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen.